19 was, was billed as what they call blue-eyed soul. Broken windows in empty hallways. Blue-eyed soul was this term that kind of emerged in the 60s when you had white artists singing what Americans would consider black music. Dusty Springfield is a perfect example of that. It's actually one that fits Adele's sound on, on 19. Um, it's quite sort of simple, quite pared down, very soulful, uh, a little bit bluesy. Some of the more developed pieces like uh, Cold Shoulder and Chasing Pavements seem to fit in to a trend that was, that was around at the time, the sort of Brit soul pop thing. Then you had Joss Stone and Amy Winehouse had sort of set a bit of a trend and later on you had Duffy. So it all seemed to be belonging to that genre of uh, pop, but closer inspection to the to the quieter, less less uh, um, less produced tracks on the album, uh, I think uh, reveal a really individual artist doing very unusual things. I mean, for instance, uh, there's a couple of tracks where she she just sings to her own bass playing, which is a very unusual thing to do, and it's 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 barely mentioned these days when you compare it to the extraordinary achievements business-wise that everything else has done later on. Hardly anybody refers to the idea that she was singing to her own bass playing with hardly any other instruments around. You say all of the right things without a clue But you say the best for last like I'm the one for you You should know that you just stay temporary fix This is not routine with you on a track like Best for Last, you have her establishing a particular groove and a particular harmony. Then she establishes another one, and then there's a third one for the chorus. And the first time I heard that, I thought, how's the bass player keeping up with what she's doing? And then I realized she's playing it herself. That's amazingly unusual. And it's something that's, that's been completely overlooked in the wake of everything else that's happened uh, since. Perhaps inevitably, there was one artist to whom Adele was most frequently compared. Another young British soul singer, another Brit school graduate, and a multi-award winner who had found rare success across the Atlantic, Amy Winehouse. With Adele, she just seemed to be much more straightforward to me in the way that she treated a song and treated a ballad. And she was much more about ballads than Amy Winehouse. So quite different, really, um, in their approach. Certainly there are moments on 19 where you can hear a record company, if not the artist herself, chasing after the success of Amy Winehouse. It, 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 it's there in the sound, and it's there in the production. Uh, it's not what she would continue doing, but it is the direction she could have gone in. Apart from the Brit School connection, there's, there's, a, there's an obvious uh, connection in that she's essentially a soul singer or she has a, a, a considerable soul flavor to her singing and secondly she's a cheeky girl with a lot of attitude and I think that's uh, when she says you know that uh, people like Amy Winehouse opened the door for her in America uh, America got used to the idea of a, of a Brit soul singer coming over and, and uh, with, a, with a, a bit of a mouth on her. So by the time Adele came along, they kind of got used to that. A direct link with Amy Winehouse, however, came in the shape of Adele's third single. Produced by longtime Winehouse collaborator Mark Ronson, Cold Shoulder proved to be notably less successful than Chasing Pavements, barely making the UK top 20. I think it's interesting the fact that people are so interested to know who these songs are about. No one assumes these songs are fictional or uh, based on other people's experiences, sort of in that way Ray Davies or whoever will write about stories about other people. Everyone assumes these are pages pulled straight from Adele's diary. Who is this guy who broke your heart? Let's go kick his ass. And Cold Shoulder was, I think, the first one that the tabloids definitely perked up on and was like, who's this song about? And I think that is telling and showing that it really struck a nerve lyrically uh, in terms of people wanting to know who this woman was and wanting to know the story behind her. And Cold Shoulder is the song that did that. Cold Shoulder is a great example of the way Adele uses metaphor. Sometimes she's a little bit clumsy with the metaphor. You shower me with words of ice. But at the same time, it's a nice metaphor um, for that 
rather devastating feeling at the end of a relationship when someone's just not into you. Going over a lot of the songs on 19 are almost a teenage diary in the sense of love and loss, but there's a real tenderness about it as well. When the rain is blowing in your face. 19 featured one song that was not an Adele original. Released in October 2008 as the final single from the album, Make You Feel My Love, a Bob Dylan cover, went on one of the longest chart runs of all time and became an ever-present in British television soundtracks. Make You Feel My Love, to me, is the big achievement on the first album. That song was immediately recognized in America as a hit song. The first uh, artist to pick up on Make You Feel My Love was Garth Brooks, who took it to number one on the country chart. Very nice version. Billy Joel put it as a new track, one of two, on a greatest hits album of his. And then Adele, intuitively recognizing that this is a great song for all styles, gave it her own twist. And it was the best. Of all of the versions, including Bob Dylan. And that's what said to me, this is a great singer. It's almost easier to tell when you've got a classic song which you can compare with other fine vocalists in other styles rather than one of her own originals, which no one else has sung yet. But when you can compare, you think, my gosh, she's got it. So that's why off of 19, Make You Feel My Love was the one that made me think this is a long-term artist. I'd go hungry, I'd go black and blue And I'd go crawling down the avenue No, there's nothing that I wouldn't do I'm not a Bob Dylan fan, so I wasn't aware of this track. Uh, and they played it to me in, in a little Walkman, and I sat and worked out essentially what was going on. I think we made a few alterations just to, you know, sort of, for want of a better phrase, tidy up the song because you know Dylan's sort of all over it, you know, sort of, you know, you know, sort of um, very much, it's very much guitar and sort of folky and quite free. Whereas we sort of perhaps, you know, made it a little bit stricter. And it was the same process. It was Adele over there in that corner. She's always in that corner. She's never in that corner, but she's always in that corner uh, behind the uh, behind the glass. And uh, again, it was a cut, about two or three takes. And um, <clears throat> uh, I remember Jim just saying, yeah, I think we've got it. I really do. I think we've got it. The album's finished. And we had another song that we then took off to put Make You Feel My Love on it. Um, and I, I, I love other people's songs, but I don't like covering other people's songs because I never think I can do them just for justice, you know. And, and they're... And they're other people's songs and I don't want to touch them because they're quite personal I think songs but I heard that song and I read the lyrics and they're the most beautiful lyrics I've ever read or heard or sung and they just kind of summed up everything that I've been trying to write in my songs about how I felt um, and it's, it's my favourite song I think it's such a beautiful song Make It For My Love um, so that one's important because before even though I thought the album was complete and finished when I heard that it just kind of summed up and it like if my album was a shape before I heard that, the album was kind of like that. And then when I did it, it kind of became a whole circle, which that's, that's really important to me as well, that song, and important for the album, I think. Make You Feel My Love is a surprising good choice, better written than anything on the record, because it's written by Bob Dylan, but a surprising good choice because it's very much in keeping with that romantic and sexual longing on the rest of the record. And also, it points the direction to the next record just in the production and in the writing of the song. This is one of those Dylan songs that works a little bit like an old school 40s or 50s ballad crossed with an American gospel song. When Dylan writes on the piano, and that's the way this song is put across, you often get that kind of feeling. It was very funny hearing her iTunes version of this, because iTunes uh, recorded a live performance in an Apple store in New York. And she introduces it in this incredibly girly, giggly voice talking about an anecdote that 
last night she had sung this with Alicia Keys. She's got that incredible accent, which is very thick, which the American audience doesn't mind. Now that is very significant because usually American audiences aren't interested in acclimatizing themselves to various British accents. They can't be bothered. They don't want to put the time in. But with Adele, her accent is taken not as an impediment to understanding, but as an indication of her sincerity, of her realism, that she really is one of us. She's one of the common people. I played um, Make Me Feel My Love with Adele at this, uh, uh, this Alicia Keys charity night. And all the, uh, all the sassy uh, makeup ladies from America were saying, I love Adele, I love her. You know, and they were just obsessed, they adored her. You know? And I, at that moment I thought, I got this sense of, wow, the American public, the, the R&B public, the pop public, the country public, they could all get her. She wasn't, she wasn't any particular one, she wasn't threatening, she was lovable, and I could see, I could see how she was going to be big if they played it right. Please welcome Adele. And the headwaters of huge success in America began at the turn of 2009. Following Mercury Music Prize, MOBO and Q Award nominations in Britain, Adele was tipped for awards in four categories at the 51st Grammys in LA. Having won for Best Female Pop Vocal with Chasing Pavements, she immediately embarked on a mini tour of the US that culminated in a show at the Hollywood Bowl. On returning to Britain, the singer was presented with three Brit Award nominations. And with public interest in her life and work rising, she began to turn her mind towards writing new material. The first album, half of it, is just a 19-year-old kid finding stuff out, trying to work out what she's gonna do with this talent. Everyone else is just listening open-mouthed and she's just coming up with these little songs using unusual chords. For instance, Daydreamer is a very unusual piece. It, it starts with a, a simple A major, A major chord. A major, just typical singer-songwriter territory, falls under the fingers. Second chord is this. which is D with a sharp 11 and a 9, which is not typical singer-songwriter territory. That's, that's advanced Joni Mitchell territory. This is, this is upper colours of chords, which is not what, what every 18-year-old singer-songwriter will uh, stumble upon and be interested in. And not only that, she then crafts a really sophisticated melody, the way a jazz musician would. The way a, a jazz saxophone player would look for the pretty notes. That's what, uh, I think, that's what uh, Ben Webster used to call playing jazz. Look, just looking for the pretty notes. That's what she's doing. She, she's just looking for them. And not only is she looking for them, she's finding them and nailing them. That's her talent. A Georgia bird looks good when he walks is the subject of their talk. He be hard to chase, but good to catch and he could ch Whenever like, I have a successful writing session, or it's never really a session, it always comes at a really awkward point in my day. I always try and pinpoint what it is exactly that's made that song end up being finished and, and, and me thinking it's good enough to be on a record to play to people. Um, I always try and work out what it is so I can sort of jar it and then use it whenever I want to write a song, but I never can. It's usually in the middle of the night, like I wake up in a cold sweat and I've got an idea or I'm just kind of playing the guitar or playing on the piano or sometimes I am in the studio with someone um, when I get up in the middle of the night to go for a glass of water, you know, and I've got nothing, I've just got to grab my Blackberry and sing into it. Um, varies. It's frustrating though, but I quite like it because, I mean, apart from when it's like three in the morning and you're really tired and you want to sleep, but you can't sleep because otherwise you're going to lose the idea. But my, also, my motto is if you can't remember it, it's not good enough. If you can't remember something, it's not good enough. But um, yeah, it's never, um, it's never when I'd like it to be. Sometimes if I sit there and plan it, like some of the worst songs that have ever graced the earth come out. <laughs> so yeah, varies. I think of Adele as a singer-songwriter. Merely stylistically different from the classic singer-songwriters from the period which we think of as the singer-songwriter period, which is the early 70s. 
She's just as confessional as Joni Mitchell.